What's cracking, beautiful people out there on YouTube? My name is Nicholas. Welcome to the HQ. Welcome to Big Dogs Gotta Eat, BDGE, Fantasy Football. Let me make sure this thing's set up correctly. It looks like it is. It is Friday, and every Friday we are doing a 2019 Fantasy Football Mock Draft. And that is presented by Draft.com. So, what I always do is I open up these mock drafts for people that are in my audience. But you have to be on draft.com, obviously, and you can add me on there, as you see on the screen. My username is Nick Ercolano, and your boy, it's payday. So I took 96% of my paycheck today, and I threw it onto draft.com. We have $25.90 to play with, baby. So I'm actually going to um, do a 12-team draft today, $1 buy-in, because one, these things fill up like that, and everybody's always complaining. I can't get in. I'm like, listen, you gotta be, you gotta have an itchy trigger, itchy, itchy trigger finger. You know what I'm saying? So, we're doing 12 teams. So an extra two people can get in. I hit create, boom, and it sends out auto invites to all of my friends on there, and then I will pull it up on the draft website. So they have a fantastic app. They also have a fantastic website. There you go. Friday's YouTube film, and we are filled already. That was record time. I would be the fastest running back. I wonder what position I'd be at the combine. I'd be the fastest analyst at the combine, no doubt. So I have the number seven pick in a 12-team draft. And on draft.com, again, guys, if you're new here, draft is a best ball app. Best ball means that you only draft. You don't make any waiver wire moves, no trades, no in-season stuff. But that is basically the best part of fantasy football, right? Drafting is fun and taking advantage of the early average draft positions, the ADPs, if you're unfamiliar with uh, the term ADP, it's average draft position. So uh, you could take advantage of a lot of these guys where they're going. A lot of guys that are going in the ninth round right now will probably be like fifth round picks by end of August and things like that. So I like doing a lot of these mock drafts throughout the off season and they open them up as soon as like the 2018 season ended. So um, best of all drafts, you draft a big team, 18 players, no kickers, no defense. Also my favorite part, half PPR, you could do anywhere from three up to 12 teams in a league. You can create your own league once you're on here and invite your friends to play with you or invite me. I'll come in probably and join. Um, so we see C-Mac, Barkley. I'm going to guess it's going to go Kamara and then Zeke. Wow, I am good. And one of my bold predictions a couple of weeks ago was that David Johnson would end up being a consensus top five pick by the time drafts roll around. And that is looking like the case. His ADP has flown up. Wow, number four over Zeke. Huh? That is that is the most questionable thing I have seen since I saw someone put ketchup on steak the other day. So we have Zeke at five. Imagine being in the five pick and getting uh, Zeke there. So I'm in an interesting spot because those are my top six players right there, basically, right? Those six, oh, not David Johnson, but those five running backs and then David Johnson went. My favorite player off the board next is Devontae Adams. And, you know, I went really deep into Devontae. Oh, oops. I don't know why I just did that. I hit deposit by accident. Let me just pull it up on my app. So you could switch between the app and the website. Okay, well, they took D-Hop. Not a big deal. D-Hop, Devontae Adams, kind of interchangeable. But <clears throat> the process is make sure you don't hit deposit instead of draft when you're drafting, guys. Pro tip. I'm a professional here. So I let you know all the mistakes not to make. Uh, I love Devontae Adams. And like I said, I went really in depth with him on my uh, wide receiver rankings by tier video that I did last week, and I'll link it up in the um, in the in, or I'll link it down there in the show notes for you guys. But um, I, I'm really coming around to the fact that I'm probably going to end up with a wide receiver there in my high stakes league. So I know that I'm probably going to have around the eighth or ninth pick, and this year there are that top tier of running backs that I like, and I usually like to leave the draft with. Um, a top tier running back uh, within the first two rounds, at least. But once we get past the, the top guys, those top six guys, and then I put Joe Mixon in there as well. I, I'm not a huge fan of Le'Veon. I'm not a huge fan of, of James Conner uh, using that as the back end of the first round pick. So I've decided that I'm probably at the eight spot. If those five guys are off the board, I'm going to end up taking probably DeAndre Hopkins or Devonte Adams. Um, and then on the second pick, I would either stack it up with another one of those guys, a high-end wide receiver one, or a Travis Kelsey or a Joe Mixon if one of them falls to me. It is a 12-team league, and I'm probably going to have the eighth or ninth pick. So um, 
so it's realistic to to assume that you know two of those three guys are going to fall to me. So I'm thinking about probably having Devonte Adams as my one, and um, I'm I'm a huge fan of Adams, and I'm I think he's going to absolutely go nuts this year. So we've had Kelsey go off the board. Well, it was Devonte Adams, Michael Thomas, Kelsey, Mixon, Bell, Julio starts the two one, Juju, Odell, Antonio Brown, James Conner at two five. So at two six. There are some solid running backs still left here, which I'm probably going to decide between Dalvin Cook, Nick Chubb, Damian Williams. Uh, this is a little early for Damian Williams for me. Gurley is completely off my board in the top two rounds, probably the top three rounds. Dalvin Cook's the guy I'm looking at right now. Um, I like him all the way down here. Normally, he's going within the top 12 or 14 picks, but at the 2-6, which is, I believe, 18th overall, I'll take him as my RB1. Uh, Dalvin Cook's a guy who's absolutely you know excelled when he's on the field, and that is the big concern. And... I tweeted this out the other day that I think the single biggest mistake fantasy football players make year in and year out is not taking injuries into context. And you'll hear me talk about this a lot throughout the summer. Every injury goes into context. Injuries are not simply, you know, just part of the year that they happened in. So for instance, like AJ Green got injured in 2018. That doesn't mean just because a beat reporter expects him to be ready by OTAs that he's going to be, right? We know... We have so much information at hand, right? We know a player's injury. We know exactly when it occurred. And we know part of the the, the scientific uh, evolution of the world. We know the timetable for these returns. So if AJ Green had surgery to repair ligaments on his his turf toe in week 11, and it's a 10 to 12 month timetable, is he going to be ready by OTAs? No, this is a fact. Just because we saw a report that said he's expected to be ready by OTAs doesn't mean he is, guys. That is, like We need to take every injury into concern, knowing when it happened and knowing the exact timetable of when they're going to be fully recovered and then can start you know, getting up to game speed. If it's a 10 to 12 month timetable recovery and the guy's running by eight and a half months, like great, that's just normal recovery timetable. That doesn't mean because he's running, he's ready to make cuts and make plants and make jumps at an NFL caliber level, you know? So... Um, that's a big thing with injuries, man. I think injuries really need to be taken into context. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because Dalvin Cook. Dalvin Cook is a guy I went into the offseason extremely high on. And I think he was up to like number seven or eight in my overall rankings at one point. But I've gotten a little bit you know, less high on him because I am starting to go a little bit more risk averse in the earlier rounds. And I will talk about that in a second. Um, so we're in a 12-teamer. We're on the clock right now at the 3-7. My first pick was D-Hop. My second pick was Dalvin Cook. Now... I'm liking these mid-round wide receivers, but I also absolutely love... I love Carrion Johnson, and I'm going to go with Carrion Johnson here. A lot of people will probably disagree that it's too early um, for a guy like Carrion Johnson here. I absolutely love Carrion Johnson, though, in, in, at the end of the third round. And it's great because in that league that I was talking about in the beginning, where I have the 8 and then probably the 12 or 13 or whatever, um, I actually get to keep Carrion Johnson for, for a ninth round pick. So he will be like my starting RB2, regardless of where I go in the beginning. Um, so that's fantastic. But with Dalvin Cook, like we look at his injury history, right? He had the ACL tear, but we know that ACL tear recovery is pretty straightforward, right? Two years removed from the ACL tear, you're at full strength. And we had Dr. Morse on to talk about this and he pegged him as his top breakout running back for this year. Um, two years off of it and you're really at no re re injury risk on the ACL on the knees. Uh, and then he had the hamstring, which he dealt with. And a hamstring is not something like turf toe ligaments that are getting surgery on them, right? And there's a 10 to 12 month of time uh, timetable. Dalvin Cook came back a little bit too early last year. And that's what led to the extended absence and him missing games multiple times throughout the year. Um, but the hamstring is something that will be fully healed by the time he comes back. So we have the ACL and we have the hamstrings. Yes, he's had multiple injuries, but none of them are concerning going into 2019, right? None of them have a timetable which interferes with OTAs, with training camp, with week one of the regular season. And that's what I mean by it's so important to take every injury into context. So you might think of Dalvin Cook as an injury-prone player. And yes, he's been injured more than most of the uh, running backs that you're taking around that range in the 15 to 20 range. But in terms of going into the season as an injury risk, like he's as low as most of the running backs. Um, so that's really the point I was getting at. And uh, I went with carry on here. And in one of my, the other bold, one of the old other bold predictions I had was that um, Theo Riddick would get cut from the Lions and carry on Johnson would, 
his ADP would shoot up to a, a, a second round pick this year because people are worried about, you know, just people are just worried about Theo Riddick being there, I think, and taking pass catching work. But we know that Karen Johnson was ridiculously involved in that offense um, from a pass catching standpoint. So we, and then we saw reports come out like last week, like three or four days after I made that prediction, we saw that a beat reporter had Karen Johnson pegged as uh, someone who might catch 60 passes this year. And then Theo Riddick's like was on the roster bubble. And I was like, damn, this is like clockwork. Um, but what I was saying, ah, damn, Robert Woods, I totally just got sniped on that. What I was saying was I tend to go with more, uh, I like the running back early. Like if you can get a first round running back, that's really solid. One of those top six guys, or you can use, you know, Dalvin Cook as, as your second round pick. Like if you just stack up wide receivers, it's almost zero RB, but not necessarily zero RB. I'll, uh, I'll make my pick here for a second. Not a lot of great value left on the board, but I've said it and I'll put my money where my mouth is. If there's a running back I'm going to take in the fourth round, it's David Montgomery. I love his situation right now. But, um, you know, I can go with Dalvin Cook as my RB1. And then if you surround your two wide receivers and your two flex plays with guys that are going in um, the third, fourth, fifth round as wide receivers, like look at some of the wide receivers that you can get at the end of the third. Keenan Allen, Stefan Diggs, Julian Edelman, third, fourth round picks, Brandon Cooks. Kenny Galladay, Robert Woods, like in the fourth round, they are so, 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 so safe. Ooh, Miles Sanders at 4-8. So Miles Sanders is a guy that, uh, another rookie running back that I, I'm a huge fan of. But again, taking every injury into context, Miles Sanders has been missing time at camp with a hamstring injury. Hamstring injuries are some of the scariest injuries that you can, you know, that one of your fantasy players can get because they linger and people always come back from them too early and end up injuring other parts of their body. Now, happening this early in the offseason is not a concern for me. He will be fully ready. They'll give him ample time to rest, and he'll be back by, I don't know, beginning or mid-July. What's scary about Sanders is the fact that he's entering the year undoubtedly in a running back by committee. As a rookie, you can't miss camp time. Like, that is so valuable. So as much as I love Sanders, like, you have to be objective about this, and you have to be unbiased in the sense that Miles Sanders is going to miss time. He's going to fall back in the pecking order. And that's just, even if you think Sanders will come out of the summer as the number one, it's just more ground that Jordan Howard is gaining on him for the early down work and things like that. So, wow. Uh, Jared McGee making ridiculously questionable <laughs> picks right now. Why are you taking Golden Tate in the fifth round? Sometimes I feel like people um, join these just to trigger me. But also, maybe he has a really strong feeling towards Golden Tate. Uh, I can't imagine that was it. I'm going back now to see what his other picks were. And I'm on the clock. Aaron Jones, 3-5. That's fine. So we are in the fifth round. Again, this is a 12-teamer. So we're are probably around pick 55 to 60. And this is where I start looking at um, possibly a tight end, but I could probably wait one more round to get a, um, a, a top-tier tight end like a Hunter Henry. I'm probably looking at wide receivers because there's almost no value at, at running back left on the board. I like Sammy Watkins. I really don't have any... Mike Williams, but I'm going to go with Sammy Watkins here because I still do expect Tyree Kill to take some sort of a suspension. And in that time, Sammy Watkins will play probably very well. Um, and we look back like at last year, right? I mean, Watkins missed a lot of time and there were games where he was supposedly active and then just missed the entire game pretty much. But when he came back at full strength in the playoffs, guys, he had like two really big games in both of their playoff games. He was, um, he went like eight for... He got eight targets in both games, I know. I don't have the numbers right now to pull up. Actually, I could just do that quickly for you. Same luck, if I have today. So in the in the two playoff games, eight targets, six catches, 62 yards. Eight targets, four catches, 114 yards. So he was very involved. And uh, I expect that to be the case if he's on the field. Of course, that's always the big concern. But with a guy like Watkins' upside and the fact that I haven't actually taken any wide receivers yet, um, other than D-Hop in the first round, kind of need that upside there. So uh, I like him at the end of the fifth in a 12-teamer. I'm fine with him there. Um, what else was I going to say? Oh, yeah. So going back to the injuries, right? Miles Sanders is, is missing time, and that's big. And guys, like, I can't emphasize this enough. Like, hamstring injuries... You always have to take things into context too. Like, you know how much I love Marlon Mack. Like, he is probably my favorite, you know, my favorite fantasy player this year just based on where he's going and what I think he's going to end up as. If Marlon Mack pulls his hamstring mid to late August, he's probably off my draft board. 
because people will not factor that in enough into the draft that he'll probably drop from a third round pick maybe to like a fourth, possibly fifth. But that hamstring is, that puts him at such a high re-injury risk. So when I tell you that, I will take Marlon Mack almost off my draft board because of the fact that he injured his hamstring. Same thing happened with Doug Baldwin last year. He was like my guy, basically the same position. He was like my must draft player in the third round, got injured right before the season started, and he was off my draft board. I wouldn't touch him before like the sixth or seventh round. Now we have Andrew Luck go off the board. Um, Cooper Cup. Oh man, I'm all in on Tyler Boyd. I, I feel like you guys also know that too. I kind of missed like a tight end of consequence here. Uh, I do like Tyler Boyd over Robbie Anderson. I like him over Allen Robinson. I probably need to get a little higher on Anderson. There are a lot of people that really like him. I know down the stretch, he developed that really, really, really solid chemistry with Darnold. But when I look at Anderson, and this is probably a flaw in my game, like, yeah, he could be like a Deshaun Jackson, right? But I think that's best case scenario. I don't, I feel like he's not a, a well-rounded enough wide receiver to be able to rely on consistently. And that's probably actually why I should have taken him over Tyler Boyd because Robbie Anderson is more of an upside guy. And again, for best ball, you don't actually make sit start decisions, guys. What you do is you, you draft a team of like 18 players and you let the software pick the best players each week that um, that have the best scoring for you. So for instance, I'll draft maybe seven or eight wide receivers and on every week, it will automatically start the three top fantasy scores for me. And then you'll accumulate points. And at the end of the year, you come back and, and grab your money, and then you can start drafting for 2020. Um, so again, <laughs> again, guys, you could draft with me. I open up drafts all the time throughout the weeks um, with my uh, my people that have added me on here. I always add them back. So hit up draft, draft.com, enter the promo code BDGE. When you sign up, you will get $3 to draft with, okay? $3 to draft with using promo code BDGE, then add me at Nick Ercolano on here. I believe you can only add people on the actual mobile app. So make sure you're doing it through the mobile app as well. Um, so do that. We'll draft together. We'll talk some smack together. Um, and, and things will be good and life will be good. And going back to the injury thing, um, one thing that was is newly being added to the Big Dogs Draft Guide, which launches on July 1st. So if you're watching this, it's in like 10 days. Dr. Jesse Morse, who I know y'all are a big fan of, um, will be contributing, I think, 40 individual injury write-ups. So he's doing a paragraph or two on every injury-related player um, that you could think of at every position and what his take on that player is going into the 2019 fantasy football season. And uh, he's going to give an injury rating, I guess you could say, out of 10, like how uh, how big of an injury risk each player is. So that's just like a newly added piece of value that you guys can grab um, in the draft guide. So go check that out, bigdogsdraftguide.com. It launches on July 1st, and I cannot wait. All right, so we have Tevin Coleman, Jarvis Landry, Rashad Penny, Geis, Christian Kirk, Marvin Jones are probably the guys I'm looking at right now. Man, do I love Christian Kirk. And I really like Rashad Penny as well. I don't have a lot of Rashad Penny shares. I don't really have any Jarvis Landry shares. I'm going to go with Rashad Penny because I think his upside is just enormous this year. And I like him in the seventh round. I think he's going to get plenty of playing time regardless. I mean, you look at uh, Mike Davis being gone. That opens up not only a lot of carries, but a lot of receiving work too. So even if they're a one-two punch, Penny and Carson, I expect Penny to be the much heavier relied on uh, receiving back in that offense. And he, of course, has that three down workhorse upside because of his size, his college production and things like that. Last year, of course, didn't work out as planned, but Chris Carson was just such a beast. Um, but Chris Carson is having, you know, something done on his knee, which is never a good sign. We don't know much about it. And Pete Carroll is obviously never going to give us good information on it. So <clears throat> see my man Whitehorse made it into this draft again. He makes it into every draft. He's got that red shield. And I tweeted out the draft. I asked him what the uh, red shield was for. I asked him if I can get like a golden machete or some shit to make me look super intimidating. But they, they got back to me and said that like to get a red shield, it's like you have to have entered a thousand drafts and to get a maybe a black shield, there's a certain number of drafts you got to get into. So your mans ain't getting to that anytime soon. But I might because they have dollar drafts available and that's exactly what this is. And that's the coolest part about draft is that they are not actually mock drafts. You're not actually witnessing a mock draft right now. You're witnessing a dollar draft. 
you can do anything from a dollar up to, I think they have four figure drafts, thousand, two thousand dollars They have their best ball championship open right now, which is a three and a half million dollar prize pool, guaranteed prize pool, which I'll get into in a minute. Uh, but that's the best part is because when you're drafting, it's very realistic to where guys will be going in the drafts. Yes, I understand it's best ball and it's not exactly like season long. So some guys are valued a little bit more and some guys are valued a little bit less. But comparing drafts where the buy-in is even a dollar to like an ESPN or a Yahoo where you're doing mock drafts, the ADPs are so much more accurate on this. And that's why I suggest, you know, you, you, you get on draft.com, you throw $10 into your account and boom, you could do a mock draft. That'll get you all the way through August. You will you can do one mock draft, $1 mock draft a week for the next 10 weeks, and you'll have done 10 drafts in prep for your actual draft. You know what I mean? So throw $10 into the account and you can get an extra $3 by using promo code BDGE and you will be so much more prepared going into your 2019 fantasy football season. Damn, I was really hoping Christian Kirk fell to me there. Uh, this is where I should probably start looking at, I don't see a lot of value on the board when it comes to Skill positions, ooh, God. So tight ends look ugly. Uh, I'm probably going to grab my first quarterback here. And we have brought someone onto the team, my man Steven. You should go follow on Twitter because he's putting out specifically, he's only in the best ball niche. He's putting out blog posts on, uh, on the blog every week, if not multiple times a week. And the blog is on bigdogsfantasy.com. My computer runs a little slow when I have OBS recording this and everything's uh, running at the same time. But uh, my man, Steven, and you can follow him on Twitter. His Twitter name is right here, at SRMullen1979. He's been working very hard behind the scenes. We actually finally got some data from Draft.com about the teams that were put together last year and win percentages and things like that. So he's been diving very deep into the statistics, and I'm telling him to feed me over as much good stuff as we could possibly get And uh, some of the cool things that he's found, he's looking into stacks. So stacking is something that I feel like people are torn between. And stacking means having multiple players on the same team. So owning a guy like um, Carson Wentz, like I just drafted, and Deshaun Jackson. Or owning Kyler Murray and Christian Kirk. Or owning Cam Newton, Curtis Samuel, DJ Moore. It could be anyone. It could be Patrick Mahomes, Travis Kelsey, Kareem Hunt last year. So it could be running backs, could be tight ends. Um, And he's looking through stacking. And what he found was that in 12-team leagues, the average win percentage was around 8.3%, right? And that makes sense. Just divide 8 by 3. Uh, 8 by 12, or 100% by 12 teams, 8.3% for each team to win. However, the win percentage of teams that stacked um, in almost every single scenario was at a higher win percentage. Teams that stacked the quarterback with the wide receiver one, one at an average rate of 10.16%. So obviously that's better than your normal averages in a 12-team league. Teams that stack the quarterback with the wide receiver two, while it's obviously not as good because it's the wide receiver two as compared to the wide receiver one, still had a tiny bump in win percentage. Quarterback tight end stack was at 9%. Um, quarterback wide receiver one tight end at 12%. Now, a lot of these are, I mean, it's a big sample size, right? So it, it does work for a lot of different scenarios. Um, But a lot of those numbers will be very high based on the fact that I'm sure a lot of people stacked Kelsey with Mahomes, Kelsey with Tyree Kill, Tyree Kill with Kelsey and Mahomes. You know what I mean? So those are going to make the the, the numbers higher. But all in all, if you're going to get a 2% increase in uh, win percentage, right? That's you got to look for any of these small little things that will uh, eventually work in your favor. So what I'm going to be doing is making a conscious effort now in best ball leagues to stack my run, uh, my quarterbacks with my wide receivers. And this is a perfect example because not only do I think getting Deshaun Jackson in the ninth round of a 12-teamer is value, but he now stacks up with Carson Wentz, who, by the way, I believe has the second highest odds per Vegas to win the MVP behind Patrick Mahomes. Uh, let me see this. NFL MVP odds 2019. Mahomes plus 350. So he's a three to one, still a three to one underdog, but he's still the favorite. Wentz, that is crazy coming off of last year. Wentz is the second favorite to win the MVP. So guys, I can't like relay enough how big of uh, a value pick Carson Wentz is at the quarterback position, right? He was like my number one bounce back player in the video I made for like post type sleepers a few weeks back. And he's still going in like the double digit quarterback range. So Wentz is the second highest odds for MVP. I think luck at plus 600 is absolutely fucking ridiculous. 
I think that's easily the best value on the board. I think Rodgers at plus 800 is fantastic as well because the Packers kind of revamped their defense. And as long as the Packers are like a good team, Rodgers will be in the top three for MVP voting. Um, so I absolutely love the stack I just made. And Deshaun, there's a good chance that Deshaun Jackson ends up as the technical wide receiver one over Alshon Jeffrey. If we're talking about stats, I know Vegas has Deshaun Jackson's odds um 50 50 of going over 900 receiving yards and everything out of camp is that the chemistry between them two has been uh absolutely fantastic so i think that that right there that pick probably boosts my win percentage i would have loved to have gotten dallas goddard to make that the wide receiver tight end stack even though he's technically a tight end too of course Um, but i love his upside um the other thing too uh you know steve's put a lot of good work into these he has a lot of good numbers to um just started to get a draft of something, man. So I took the Lemon Bell at 112 because the Arby's, I like it, closed out. Okay, so Steve's actually in this draft. I didn't realize he was in that draft, but that's cool. He is the... Is he, I'm not sure what his name is, to be honest. I think he's Cass, Cass Fan because he said he took Joe Mixon at the 112, so he's the 12 spot. Um, so we can get his explanation on this too. So I took Lev Bell at the 112 because the RBs I like get closed out before the 312 and it paid off since there were zero RBs. I was willing to take a 3-4 turn. That makes happy. Uh, I'm super happy to get Mike Williams in wide receiver four. I thought I took, no, no, I didn't take Mike Williams. I took Watkins. Oh, I'm on the clock with 14 seconds left. Fantastic. Who do we like on the board? Uh, I don't have a tight end yet, do I? Um, Okay, so y'all know I really hate Austin Hooper, but as my only tight end, okay, don't time out. They're going to time out on me, aren't they? Damn it. I have too many programs running at once. Let me close down all this nonsense I don't need in the background. Uh, the the app the app is so good, dude. Um, I wish that I wish that I could do the drafts on the app and screenshot at the same time, but I cannot, unfortunately. Uh, let me also plug in that cable. Oh man, just disregard my absolute get away set up right now how y'all doing by the way it's friday it's gonna be a beautiful weekend it's my roommate's birthday this weekend along with one of his best friends so they're having a little throwdown at their apartment tomorrow which i'm super fucking excited about it's gonna be a fantastic party um are we hooked up did i close out the internet the interwebs oh we so bike we so bike honestly stop whatever you're doing go on draft.com and sign up right now and add me. I want more friends. I have like 310 friends. I'm fucking pumped about that. I only have like four friends in real life, but I have 310 friends on draft. Y'all make me feel okay about things. Oh, we timed out. Who did we take? Oh, I'll bet we took Austin Hooper. So Austin Hooper's another guy like I don't love, but in the 10th round of a 12 teamer where there's like no one left on the board, I'm okay with that. And I'll probably end up grabbing three tight ends. Um, The other thing to pay attention to, if you are drafting on desktop, they don't have the bye weeks listed here. So you have to be cognizant of making sure if you go two quarterbacks or two tight ends that you don't draft them that have the same bye week because that will be an issue. I have almost no James Washington. I have very little Metcalf. I have almost no Metcalf. I kind of like Tyrell Williams, yo. I don't think I have any of him, so I'm going to do that. Again, one of the biggest like lessons I preach is to diversify the revenue. If you do a lot of drafts, whether it's best ball or if you do a lot of season-long drafts, I'm usually in like five or six. It's so good to get a couple, to get a guy that you hate in one of your leagues and, and vice versa. Um, some guys that you don't think you've gotten enough of, maybe draft in one or two leagues because we're all going to be wrong about a lot of shit. This is the hardest sport in, in, in the world to project. And uh, we get 
If we get 60% of our projections right, we're looking really, really, really solid. But that also means we're getting 40% of what we think is right wrong. So do you want to absolutely just fade 40% of what you think is uh, what you think is right, wrong, and then that's going to cost you a lot of stuff in fantasy. Um, and James Washington is a good is a good uh, example of that, right? And uh, he's someone I've been very vocal about. As soon as the AB trade went off, I talked about how I just don't like James Washington at all. He's going to get far too much hype, and I've stayed packed with that for a long time. And everyone's like, he's the clear wide receiver too. And I was like, I kind of like Moncrief. And then we saw a report come out a couple days ago that Moncrief is like the shoe in for the wide receiver too. Now I'm not taking that, you know, that, I don't think that's like sharpied in at all. Um, and I still think there's going to be a complete battle for wide receiver two. But the fact that he's being pinned as the wide receiver two right now means that he's doing really well in camp and he's at least like playing that role. So it's, it's basically his to lose. Um, and I don't think that, like I said, I don't think it's locked in, but like for all the people that are so high on James Washington and getting so mad at me for saying not to take him, like that's not good news for you. Um, what else we got here? So I might even grab another tight end this early. Let me see my team right now. Yeah, they don't have the buys listed. On the app, they have it nice and clean where the uh, where the buys are listed. So I would suggest actually drafting on the app. The only time I do it on the website is when I am filming for you guys. So a lot easier to check things out here. Also, Newber has a bye week of nine. Chris Herndon, bye week of four. I really like Mark Andrews too. Everything out of camp is saying that he looks way better. And I don't take these camp reports for like 100% face value. But what I think you need to take into consideration is, I would say when there's smoke, there's fire. But don't make smoke out of nothing. Uh, that's ironic. Someone just took Dante Moncrief. Um, I'm glad they took him before James Washington. Um, so I think Mark Andrews will probably fall another round. So I'm going to wait for him. And I'm pretty pissed that Deion Lewis got taken there. Good pick by Justice Hill. Uh, I low-key love Matt Breida. Like, I will I will say it over and over again. I don't care that his chest is fucking torn off his body right now. He's going to be out there, and he's the most talented back in that backfield. I get that question all the time. I feel like I answer this every week. If I'm taking anyone in the San Francisco 49ers backfield, it's the cheapest one, which is Breida. And he happens to be my favorite and most talented one. Tevin Coleman is a good example, too, of a guy I've been absolutely fading that I should probably pick up on in terms of owning a little bit more because Tevin Coleman is someone that's going in like the sixth or seventh round. Like, no matter how you look at it, this is going to be a running back by committee. No one is going to be the featured workhorse here. Coleman's going to get his passing work eaten into. Um, Coleman's going to get his early down work eaten into. Maybe he gets the goal line work, but maybe a few games he gets like six carries and Breida gets 11 and McKinnon gets... Uh, nine. Um, and I think that's going to happen a lot. And I think that it's going to be um, a huge issue in season long. So they are very far down my draft boards in season long leagues because you'll never be able to predict when to play each one. In best ball, I, I like to take a lot of Brita um, later in the draft, 12th, 13th round. Tevin Coleman is a guy I will draft if I see him. I will draft him in the eighth round only because I know I don't have any stock in him, but I won't draft him. I won't diversify the revenue if it's still a reach, if that makes sense too. So take that in mind as well. Um, I have one quarterback, and we're getting to the point where the second tier of quarterbacks is probably getting a little bit of a reach. Yeah, we just saw, damn it, I thought Mark Andrews was going to fall to me. That's what we call getting snipe pieced. Um, and, and talking about the 49ers, uh, people, a lot of people like Pettis to break out. I like what we saw down the stretch, but we also have to remember that Pettis really never played with Jimmy G, so we have no idea how them two are going to play together because he went off when Jimmy G was sidelined, of course, with the injury. Um, and then, you know, we're, we're hearing more hype about him now. Like the, we just heard a report about, you know, Dante Pettis is, is going to be the wide receiver one in San Francisco. He's going to be the X receiver. Like that's not fucking news guys. Like don't let hype become hype for the sake of it, for the sake of being hype, right? If there's a report that comes out and just says a player's name, people are going to get excited about it regardless of what it even says. Oh, Dante Pettis is a wide receiver one. Obviously they literally don't have any other wide receivers on the depth chart except a rookie and Debo Samuel. Um, so that shouldn't be news to you. That should not change any outlook that you have on him. And uh, looking at my quarterback twos here, I do want to get a second quarterback because if I miss here and then there goes a, a, a little run, like I'm looking at a Mar Marcus Mariota or something like that. So the guy I'm targeting right now, okay, I'm going to grab Matt Stafford as long as he doesn't have the same bye week as Carson Wentz. Wentz has a week 10 bye. Matt Stafford has a week five bye. So we're good to go. Now, Matt Stafford... 
is an interesting case. We heard reports last week come out that he was playing with a broken back. We don't really know when this occurred. What we do know is that he um, he went on the injury report in week 14 with the broken back, right? That is when he went on the injury report. And if we use a Rotoviz game screener app, which is one of my apps mentioned in uh, an awesome article in my draft guide. I've actually named the article How to Become the Goat Fantasy Football Player, but it's really just like my top 20 favorite resources for fantasy football players um, in terms of where I find my stats and how I do my research and how I become a better fantasy football player. This is one of them. And this is a, a splits app where basically you could look at any player and see like how they did in certain weeks or how they did um, versus top pass defenses or whatever. And what we see here with Stafford is super interesting. As I mentioned, he went on the injury report in week 14 of last year. So if we split him up from weeks 1 to 13 and then 14 to 17, make sure I'm not on a clock. Nope. Here's what we see. Look at the right side there compared to the left side. His touchdowns were split in half. His attempts dropped by seven and a half attempts per game. His passing yards went from 260 almost down to 173. Like, that would make sense given the reports that he broke his back and that's when he went on the injury report. So if he was playing the last four games with broken pieces in his back, that would explain where the big drop-off was. And if that didn't happen, maybe we're looking at a case where we don't look as Matt Stafford as a, as a shitty quarterback option. So he's someone that I really like this year as someone you can get like late as your quarterback too in super flex leagues. I mean, you look at the weapons around him. He has Marvin Jones, who was doing awesome last year before he left with his injury. Kenny Galladay, um, coming into his own as a wide receiver one. They pick up Danny Amendola, who I think is going to be able to pick up some of the, like 70% of the slack that Golden Tate put up there. Karan Johnson is developing as one of the, you know, better running backs in the league. They have a great offensive line. I think they were seventh or eighth in the NFL last year per pro football focus and pass blocking. So realistically, this should be a good offense. Uh, A lot of it's obviously going to be determined by um, Bevel coming in as the OC, and he's super, super run heavy, and we know they're going to want to run the ball a lot. Um, so if that's the case and Matt Stafford's pass attempts go down to like, you know, like the low 500s, he's maybe not going to be the greatest fantasy option, but I think he's going to be super, super, super efficient. So we have my second quarterback. I'll probably go with two quarterbacks. We have, um, one tight end, but there's no value on the board at tight end. So I'll be looking at wide receivers and running backs. And I don't know what the stat was or what the finding was, but I know Steve put it in, I I think his first article that he put up on the site. So make sure you're following him. Make sure you check out the article. But if you have... I can't remember for seven or eight wide receivers. Um, I'm interested in getting one of these Buffalo Bills wide receivers too. I've been splitting it up between John Brown and Robert Foster, but I feel like a few of them are going to catch like ridiculous deep number balls from Josh Allen. Josh Allen attempted a deep pass on 19.5% of his throws last year, which was number one in the NFL by a pretty wide margin. Um so regardless, John Brown and, and Robert Foster are both very good deep threats. So I, I find myself taking one of those two in like the 14th to 16th round of a lot of my best ball drafts. Let's see what else is going on here. Hollywood Brown went at 13, 12. I'm going to pick a couple random teams and kind of diagnose what I see so far. Scatalono, very Italian. How you doing? Uh, you know what? Let me click on his team name. I clicked on AP by accident. Where you at, though? Oh, great, great picture, bro. Look very cute. I'm going to zoom in for you. This is who I'm fucking about to roast. What are you doing there? What you doing there, fam? Um, Melvin Gordon, Nick Chubb. Love that running back stack. Big fan of Thielen, Ridley, QT. Um, I would say the wide receivers are probably a little bit weak, but that's only because obviously you went running backs very early. Ridley, I really like. I've talked about how I think he's going to excel in this their cutter offense. I think he could lead the league in deep deep ball uh, receptions, Calvin Ridley. So don't be surprised that happens. QT, I really like. Think about QT. Someone commented, uh, was like, why why am I so into Kiki QT this year? My reason was this, guys. He came into the year as a rookie, right? Came into the year as a rookie with a hamstring injury. So he was played with a hamstring injury for the beginning of the season. He played in seven games. You could see the game logs down here. Hopefully I'm not, my big ass face isn't taking up any of the numbers. He played in seven games last season one including the playoffs, he had stat lines of 15 targets, 11 receptions, 109 yards. 
Seven targets, six receptions, 51 yards, and a touchdown. Nine targets, five receptions, 77 yards. I think I just didn't say targets in that last stat line, by the way. Um, And then 14 targets, 11 receptions, 110 yards, and a touchdown in the playoff game, guys. So you're looking at four really, really, really good games out of QT in his rookie year, coming off of a hamstring injury. That's more than 50% hit rate in big games. Four to seven games he played really, really well in. And he's paired with Deshaun Watson, who is one of the up-and-coming premier quarterbacks in the NFL. Like, I love QT. And if Will Fuller goes down, there's a good chance that QT ends up with like 120 targets this year, if not more. Um, so I like QT there. Obviously, he's a little bit riskier as a wide receiver three just because he's not, he's not a shoe in by any means. Um, who else we got going on here? Naeem Hines. I'm so off Naeem Hines and want nothing to do with Crowder, Duke Johnson, CJ Anderson. I find myself taking a lot of Mike Davis, so I'm going to diversify. Chris Thompson is a name that's going pretty... Uh, pretty under the radar but I'm gonna go with Albert Wilson because I'm probably gonna go with eight wide receivers here Albert Wilson's a guy who's shined on a very small sample size he is um, a killer in Matt Harmon's reception perception that he does in the uh, the fantasy footballers ultimate draft kit and also fantasy footballers come to New York City next Saturday myself snacks and animal are going to that show we're gonna do a live meetup at some bar beforehand so if you are make sure you drop a comment down below we'll meet up beforehand grab some margaritas Get a little shit-faced and uh, go heckle the footballers. Um, But Albert Wilson had three touchdowns of 40-plus yards last year. He only played in seven games. He only had 26 catches on the year. Three of them were 40-plus yard touchdown catches. He is uh, ridiculous against zone coverage. He is really good after the catch. Um, Just a great slot receiver. And I think he's a great um, late-round pick. Of course, he's coming off a serious injury, so that's something to monitor. But... This Miami offense literally added nothing to the receiving core. They re-signed Devontae Parker. They still have Kenny Stills. And it's Albert Wilson coming back from the injury. So they didn't add like a real tight end. They didn't add a running back that catches passes. Ryan Fitzpatrick came in and Josh Rosen as the quarterback. So there's going to be an upgrade probably. Um, So there's a good chance that, you know, one of these guys does well. And I'll take the chance of Albert Wilson seeing that he's one of the most efficient wide receivers in his uh, short sample size time. Um, to be that guy, man. I'm okay with him. Let me see if I could pull up stats about what... There was There was one roster construction um, thing from Steve that had a higher win, win percentage than every other roster constructed. And I can't remember if it was eight wide receivers or seven, but I feel like it might have been eight wide receivers, five running backs, and two tight ends maybe. So we're in the 16th round right now. And... Uh, there's only 18 rounds in this draft. Again, there's no kickers, no defense, which is fucking amazing. I love that. Thank you, Draft, for never changing that. And don't ever change that. Uh, again, if you guys want to draft with me, draft.com. Enter BDGE with the promo code. You'll get $3 to draft with. You can add me at Nick Urcolano. So Noah Fant just went off at the 15-9. With Noah Fant, I get a lot of questions, Fant and Hawkinson. Noah Fant is someone I'm not even touching in redraft leagues this year. Uh, I really don't expect him to get more than like 350, 400 receiving yards. TJ Hawkinson, I think, will absolutely finish the year. Oh, yeah, I didn't even mention TJ Hawkinson when I was talking about Stafford, another great red zone weapon for him. Hawkinson is a guy I think will finish the year as a tight end one. Um, I mean, take take with that what, what you want to. Um, in terms of tight end one, that could be, you know, tight end 12. It could be tight end 11, which isn't very useful in fantasy. But if you're in a 12-team league, you need a tight end one. And I absolutely think Hawkinson will be there. He's going to be a three-down skill set right off the bat. He'll be playing on every down, every snap of his rookie year, which will only lead to opportunity. Uh, One guy I see, Malcolm Brown is a guy I want. Um, So obviously, you know that Todd Gurley is a monster injury risk, and I'm not taking him anywhere, which means... There's a good likelihood that Henderson and Malcolm Brown are the beneficiaries of this injury to Gurley, who's just gotten an absurd amount of touches over the last two years. As Daryl Henderson, Darrell, I don't know how to say it, keeps creeping up into the fifth, sixth round, I will take Malcolm Brown 10 rounds later all day and tomorrow. They've already came out and said Malcolm Brown is the three down skill set guy in that backfield, and that Darrell Henderson is more of a change of pace, pass catching back like an Alvin Kamara. So if something happens to Gurley, Malcolm Brown will be the Mark Ingram to Alvin Kamara. And Mark Mark Ingram and Todd Gurley have both gotten an absurd amount of goal line touches over the last um, two years in their respective offenses. So the fact that Malcolm Brown is going 10 rounds after Darrell Henderson is ridiculous. Um, Darrell Henderson is not going to take over as the featured workhorse there. He's barely 200 pounds. um, So like... 
stop taking him in the fifth round. Literally stop taking him in the fifth round, guys. You're, you're, you're hurting yourselves. Fuck, I should have grabbed Ian Thomas there. I, mean, I totally forgot to grab another tight end. So I'm going to need to do that. And, uh, you know, I, I, I've talked up Ricky Seals-Jones a lot. But now, again, like, you got to take every injury into context. He's been missing a lot of training camp. And, um, and that's not good with the new complex air raid offense being implemented. That being said, I'm still about to take Ricky Seals-Jones if he falls to me. Actually, let me uh, double-check the bye weeks again, though. Make sure he's bye week 12 and Austin Hooper's bye week 9. Okay, cool. So Ricky Seals-Jones is still on the board. I'm going to go Ricky Seals-Jones. Uh, I, I, I've talked about it before, and I wish that I, uh, I wish that I put him in my bounce back players video. He was quietly like a top 10 tight end in almost every efficiency category and like targets commanded category when he was on the field last year. He ran like 16 routes a game, but was targeted on nearly 30% of those routes. And uh, just a lot of that had to obviously had to do with just that offense being miserable, right? Um, My God, Steve's blowing up my Twitter. Sorry, Steve. I'm not looking at what you're saying right now. Um, so yeah, Ricky Steele Jones was targeted on an incredible amount. I think he just needs to be in an offense that will let him utilize his skill set as like a wide receiver tight end hybrid. And there's not going to be a better, um, offense situation than the Cardinals air raid offense to do that. Right. He'll probably be running a lot of routes from the slot, like interchanging with Christian Kirk, throwing Christian Kirk on the outside or Steele Jones in the middle. Um, So he's a guy that I don't hate at the end of um, best ball drafts. I might even grab a third tight end because obviously I'm not like super confident in Ricky Seals Jones, but there's not much on the, uh, on the board. Dude, I really like Dawson Knox. He's one of my favorite rookie tight ends. Speaking of, right. Cause we have fan, we have Knox. Now Knox was like a pretty athletic kid. Um, I'm going to pull up my uh, pull up player profiler. So Knox went a 46440, 84th percentile speed score, like really good metrics across the board. Third round draft capital. Um, college dominator, not good, obviously. But you could see that he was a big playmaker, 88th percentile in terms of uh, 16.2 yards per reception. Uh, now Dawson Knox goes to the Bills, who got rid of Charles Clay, and then like all of their top guys, all of the top tight ends on the depth chart got hurt immediately. I liked Dawson Knox before I heard any of these injury things. Um, let me pull up the free agency sheet. I can't even remember like who the tight ends are on on the uh, on the Bills right now. Oh God, there's no one else to take. I'll probably end up taking Jordan Knox, Dawson Knox. When is his bye week though? Bye week six. That fits. Let me just make sure there's no value at wide receiver that I like. Um, ooh, you know what? JJ Arcega Whiteside's a guy that's like. You know, when there's smoke, there's fire. There's a lot of that going around with JJ. There's There's been like four reports. That's when you need to start paying attention. When uh, I'll be able to get him in the next round. So I'll grab those. I'll actually be able to grab both these guys in the next round, but it doesn't matter. Um, when you start hearing reports from every angle, when it's teammates, when it's coaches, when it's the GMs, when it's beat reporters, when it's every angle, different people, different sources, all saying the same thing about a player looking really, fuck, he sniped. Jaws for me. Oh, that was my last pick anyways. Jeez, I'm an idiot. Anyways, um, so with Jaws, Jaws is one of those guys. We've heard nothing but amazing things all offseason, right? And uh, and usually, like, you know, like I said, cliche, that when there's smoke, there's fire. If you keep hearing it over and over again, that's when you need to start tuning in. Not if you hear one beat report of one guy, oh, he's the wide receiver one. Obviously, there's no one else on the fucking depth chart there. You know what I mean? So don't listen to, uh, take everything into context, man. The, 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 the hashtag of the season is context. Context, 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 motherfucking context. Uh, Deion Kane, for people trying to get cute, do not take him in a redraft. He's not going to be at full health until November. So that's a waste of a pick. I'm sorry, guys. Um, but back to the free agency thing. Okay, so tracker, Buffalo. Oh, I meant to go to depth charts, sorry. So if you go on Roto World and go to NFL, there's a depth charts tab here. So you can see all the depth charts. It's another resource listed in my draft guide. We'll go to Buffalo. All right, like where are you, Buff? So the tight ends. Uh, Tyler Croft got hurt immediately. Um, I think Jason Kroon went out that same 
practice. So it's literally just like Dawson Knox left there. And like I said, Dawson Knox is a super athletic tight end. Josh Allen needs weapons there. They brought in John Brown. They brought in Cole Beasley. Um, I think Dawson Knox might be low-key one of the most productive rookie tight ends only because he's being forced into a situation with opportunity. And that tends to happen. A lot of tight ends don't get the opportunity right off the bat because they have not only all the routes and stuff to learn, but all the blocking techniques and the blocking schemes that a new offense has. And that's usually why tight ends take a while to develop into real NFL caliber peoples. Um, Can we look at teams? No, we can't really. Oh, yeah, we can. Cool. So Philip Rivers is a eh, Philip Rivers is not a guy. Philip Rivers and Kirk Cousins. I wouldn't really do a stack like that because they're both kind of boring floor plays that you can't um, can't really depend on any upside week to week from them. Sam Donald, I like that. He's kind of like a little breakout candidate. I'm not about to go into every team. Let me see what Steve did with the stacks. He went seven wide receivers, six running backs. So I'm assuming that's probably the highest percentage stack that he found, considering he's the one breaking down the numbers. So go add me. You can go add Steve. Uh, you can go at FB God, Noah. I forget what his thing is. Noah PD, I think, or something like that. Um, but yeah, go check out Steve on Twitter. Go check out the blog post that he'll be putting up, I, th- I believe, every Monday. So stay tuned. If you're big into best ball, he will be dropping some good knowledge pulled from big facts, right? No more guessing on this front. We actually have the data uh, in front of us from draft.com. So thank you all for that. And that's going to wrap up this video. If you guys enjoyed it, make sure you hit that thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. We're doing a mock draft every mo- uh, every Friday. This Monday's video is going to be a really, really, really good one. I'm excited for you guys. It's uh, buy low, sell high trade targets in Dynasty Leagues, but it's really good for redraft too. Um, just a lot of, lot of good factual information from the HQ coming live to y'all. Um, and that's really it. So make sure you hop on draft.com and you can come do some mock drafts with me. Promo code BDGE for $3 to draft with. Add me at Nick or Colano. Uh, go follow me on Twitter. And that's all I got for you. BigDogsDraftGuy.com. Everything you need launches July 1st, baby. I'll see y'all next time. Peace.